the title of my talk is what I call India's third yug. And for all of you who know, yug is essentially the Indian Sanskrit word for era. And the reason I'm talking about this is because today's talk, we've had a lot of great ideas and a lot of wonderful speakers. Today's talk is only going to be about one thing. And that is this. From the beginning to the end, we are going to talk about this curve. This curve is really, really famous. It is basically the lifeblood of everything in tech. Does anyone know the name, what this is called? S-curve. It's called an S-curve, right? I mean, it looks like an S. So basically what it is, is on the y-axis it's growth, on the x-axis it's time. Now a lot of people look at this and say, well, it looks similar to a linear curve, you're growing, then after that you stop growing, big deal. No, you are wrong. The S-curve is extremely important, extremely relevant, and extremely specific. And today, I'm only going to talk about the S-curve. It feels like we are here. You see that yellow arrow? It feels like we are here. And that's why is that? It is because India, this is India's history. I'm talking specifically about tech. We can go much longer back into business and everything else, but we just look at tech. You feel like there was one S-curve, there was a second S-curve, and right now we are standing here, somewhere in the middle, and we are really confused. And this is real. For a long time, people were like, this is awesome, everything is great, you know, jobs are awesome, everything is fine. Now suddenly things have changed. Two years back, everybody was saying, fire, you know, retire early. Now everybody's asking, where are the jobs? <laughs> Sometime back, all the LinkedIn people were like, everything is awesome. We are going to be a great nation. We are going to become this many trillion dollars, this many GDP, all of that. Now you don't know. Is that written by ChatGPT? Somebody else has written it. What's going on here? We stand at a point of great uncertainty. Today's talk is not going to be about the future five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. It's not that. Today's predictions and today's talk is about today. And it's about the next one year. Because that is essentially where we need these predictions. That is where we need direction. That is where we need to see the future. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that in three ways. This is how I call the three yugs. The first yug is what I call the information technology yuga. The second one is what I call the product and internet mobiles. And the third one, well, we don't know what it is. And that's where we are standing here right now. And the reason why you should listen to me is, well, I'll give up, but most importantly, I have gone through all of the ones in the past. So if nothing, just take my lived experience of going through the first yug, going through the second yug, and then trying to tell you this is what the third one will probably be. That's the first reason. The second reason why you should listen to me is because I'm from that camp. The last reason why you should listen to me is that one of the newsletters that the Ken publishes is this newsletter called the Nutgraph. Again, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the Nutgraph is a newsletter that's written by me. I write it every Saturday. My core audience is what I call people who have hangovers. So basically I write for them because they wake up in the morning at 10 o'clock and they open their phone and they see my newsletter. So I remember that they're all going through hangovers and I try to tell a story about business and tech in India in a way that they will never forget. The goal of the Nutgraph is connections and consequences. That's what I write. I say that something happened last week, everybody is talking about it and saying, oh, this is what it means. I'm going to try to give you a larger picture, both from the past and going towards the future. So for these reasons, we're gonna talk about the S-curve and you're gonna say, what is that third yuga? Where do we stand right now and what does it mean? What do the past tell us about the future? And I'll tell you, the main thing that you have to understand is that the S-curve is an indomitable force of nature. It's like the speed of light in physics. It's like the atom in chemistry. It's essentially something that you cannot change because technology always grows in S-curves. It's a feature. It's a force of nature. You cannot change it. This is the S-curves over the last 100 years. You go to any technology across history, all of them grow in S-curves. You can see there are different kinds of S-curves, but they are all S-curves. What does that mean? There is a period where nothing happened and suddenly it explodes and then suddenly it stops. That's what an S-curve is. You can go into the future and you will see that all technology that has existed and has come up after 2005 and indeed those that's going to come even beyond are going to be the S-curve. This cannot be changed. It is a core DNA of tech. And if I, if I have to explain what's going to happen with tech in the future, we have to accept this first and understand it first. This is different from non-tech. You may say that this is very similar to how all companies grow, not exactly. Here are some examples. Um, if you take a 20 year time period of a company like say Reliance, I mean I just picked Reliance as an example, and you see the net profits, that's the yellow line over there, you'll see that it's almost linear. 
Granted, more mature company, it's growing in a certain way. If you take Tata Motors, it also has a very similar line. If you take HUL, non-tech companies typically grow linearly. That does not mean that it's always a straight line, 10%, 10%, 15%. No, it's not that way. They go some up and down, but broadly the trend line is linear and it stays over a long period of time. Reliance has been around for such a long time, HUL has been around for such a long time. I could quote several examples. Compare that to this. This is the growth of Facebook. This is a classic S curve. I mean, if you could define the S curve, you could put it in a dictionary, you could put one image next to it, it is this. Look at it. Flat, 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 explore, explore, explore. Now suddenly it has stopped. Okay. This is the S curve. The S curve is the role and the way how technology works. Like I said, it's the DNA. Tech is all about revolutions. So I've decided to bring a revolutionary here. And this is something that Lenin said, which I really like, and I think it applies to tech. A lot of tech people put this as their bio on LinkedIn. Don't follow it. But essentially, this is what they say. There are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. That's exactly what it feels like if you're in there and that's exactly what I felt like. The first period is what they call the period of uncertainty. The period of uncertainty is the part in the beginning where you don't know, is this working? Is this not working? Am I wasting my time? What is going on here? Maybe this is just a linear business. It's actually a linear line at that point in time. And you have no idea what's going on. That is the feature of the S curve. Linear graphs don't grow like that. You see the line immediately grow, so this period of uncertainty doesn't really exist because it's grown linearly. But that's not true about S curves because if you're in an S curve business, especially in tech, for a significant period of time, it feels like this is the worst idea ever. Nothing's going to happen. This has always been true. I'll give examples. Let's take Infosys. Infosys was started and founded in 1981 by Mr. Narayan Murthy and the others. It went public somewhere around 1994, but it's only really by 1997 or so that it starts to turn that corner of the S curve. That is when its growth starts to become something really significant. Think about that. 15 years it took in that period of uncertainty. But the key thing to remember is that Infosys period of uncertainty lasted for close to 15 years. Flipkart's period of uncertainty lasted for something like five. What do we know about the future? The one thing we can definitely know is that this is definitely going to be less than five. It's probably going to be closer to two years, which means this year is going to be really important. This is the year in which this curve turns. That is why we're gonna talk about today and not about something five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now. The second thing that the S-curve tells you, and this is one of my favorite things, is that when you start the roller coaster journey around the S-curve and if you're in it, you start to see two things. You start to see this thing that I call limits because think of it as when you're going in a car, maybe an F1, if you watch F1, you will know that most of the accidents and most of the things where your car goes wrong is when you either turn a corner or when you're going really straight. So when you accident, accident and you're pushing, 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 suddenly limits start to appear. And these limits start to happen in two places. Number one, it happens in the beginning, and number two, it happens just before it ends. So if you're around here and you're observing it and keeping an eye on it, you will start to see limits. And these limits are going to inform what's going to happen forward. I'll give examples again. If you look at, say, Infosys, Infosys is actually growing at close to like 40 to 45 percent until it suddenly stopped around 2013. You can check the numbers. And the reason was because when they started in 2005, when I joined a service company, their limitation was physical infrastructure. So what they did was they hired a bunch of us. In fact, they raised the hiring by like hundreds of people. We all went to office and they said, yeah, we have no office for you. All of you are on the bench. So we were on the bench for close to a year. They started constructing offices because they had hired so many people. That is what a limit looks like. Because you realize that if something is going to explode, we have to start scaling quickly and that doesn't go very well. The second thing, and of course later they hit this limit on virtual infrastructure where the cloud and everything else comes over. Now, if you look at the second yuga, the second yuga is very fascinating because I was there half of my time in these tech companies and half of the time I was at the Ken. At the Ken, once I looked back and I had this perspective on both, I came up with this thing that I called the three limits of India's internet. And these are the three limits. The first limit, and the most controversial one, is what I call India's California users. India's California users is very interesting. I found this out in 2021. 2021 again, peak of the tech boom. Everything was, everyone was going crazy. They were like, you step out, you go from like Iron Bangalore to Indranagar. There are two unicorns made by them. So there were unicorns left, right, center. They weren't that rare. Everybody was getting funding at that point in time. At the peak of this entire mad party, I wrote this thing that said, why India would not see a $100 billion company anytime soon. My logic was very simple, which is that the more you talk to people, the more you talk to founders, you understand that even though India is a big nation, and even though you have a large population, and even though there is a lot of stuff going on, the number of people who are actually buying stuff online is really, really small. It's just around 70 million people. This has increased a bit by now, but if you talk to somebody at a Flipkart or an Amazon and say, what is the number of people who have bought any one product anytime in the year? Just one. And they say it's somewhere close to 80 to 90 million people. 
The weird part is that, it's not that that's 18 to 90, maybe that'll increase. The weirdest part is the thing right at the top that I call California users, which is 10 million users. 10 million users in India punch way above their weight. These are the 10 million users who are extremely affluent. These are the 10 million users who are digital natives. These are the 10 million users who use all the apps. If you take someone like, say, Amazon. Amazon has close to, as an example, somewhere close to five to six million Amazon Prime users. This number is slightly older, maybe it has increased a bit, but at that time it was. And somebody in Amazon told me that these five to six million users account for close to 40 to 45 percent of Amazon's GDP. I want you to think about that. Four to five million users, 45 percent of Amazon's GM. It is so skewed to the top, and these are the people who are essentially pushing India's tech revolution forward. So what does this mean? It means that what companies are doing these days, and you've all probably experienced it, they are trying to do this thing that I call fortune at the top of the pyramid, which means they are basically trying to say, okay, you know what, there's no point trying to expand the market, it's gonna take longer, it's really expensive, what are we gonna do? Oh, the people who are paying, they're gonna make sure that they pay more. So, people call this many things, they call it premiumization, they call it all kinds of things, but essentially this is what's happening. If you look at, say, for, if you look at, say, vehicle sales in India, entry-level vehicle sales in India have been practically flat for the last seven, eight years. But high-end vehicles, oh man, that is exploding. If you look at, say, smartphones, last big billion day, Flipkart and Amazon will tell you entry-level smartphones are flat. But look at the sales of iPhones in India. They have exploded. Why? Because people have money at the top. And it is much better to go to the top and try to take that money rather than go below. Fortune at the top of the pyramid is what everybody is following. It's also why your services are degrading. At one point in time, if you had to book an Ola, you could say, the reason why I should book an Ola is because I get, what? Cab on time, no cancellation, and low price. Right? Today, Ola came up with something called Ola Prime Plus. And what do you get? Cab on time, no cancellation, clean cab. Dude, it's the same thing, but it's more expensive. Why? Because you're going to pay more to keep what you get. So that's the first limit. The internet market is shallow. The second limit is what I call the 10,000 engineer rule. The second limit basically got exposed when we found out that, oh, there are limits to talent in this country. You can't get so many engineers also. And I found this because Back in 2021, a lot of people remember this. There's this company called Bharat Pay, which is wonderful founder. His name is Ashneem Grover, who basically started giving out bikes to everybody who joined and giving this reference saying, take bikes, take bikes, take bikes. That is not the first time that happened, by the way. The previous time that happened was in 2014. And how do I know this happened? Because I was there. I was in Inmobi, working there, when Inmobi decided suddenly, hey, wait a minute, we have to basically give bikes and BBLs, diamonds, and all of these things to all of our employees. They did the same thing. Why? Limits. You basically had one set of people doing the same thing in the beginning because they want to retain talent because it was about to explode. And you had another set of people doing the exact same thing because they want to get new people because they're not finding anybody. Limits get exposed when you start going down the S-curve. The third limit is what I call the distribution barrier. The distribution barrier is interesting because uh, this is actually an earnings call that Reed Hastings did sometime in 2022. In the middle of the earnings call, he said, I'm so frustrated with India. You won't understand why India is not growing. And the answer to that is because there is a distribution barrier in India. You can, have the great, you can have a great product, you can have a great price, but getting it to people is expensive, and there are only certain ways to do it. There are other peculiarities of India that we found out thanks to these limits. One of them is what I call the cross-selling chasm. Cross-selling chasm is essentially something what companies do today. They basically say, I have this product, I sell this, I will get some users after some time. I will sell them this, I will cross-sell, I will upsell. It's there in all business plans, it's there in all VC decks. All right? The problem is it never works. There isn't a single company in India that has managed to crack this. People who basically do food delivery end up doing food delivery. <coughs> ask Ola. Ola tried. Every year Ola tries something different on their app. Open the app and see. Someday they're trying to ask me to sell cars. Someday they're doing food. Sometimes they're doing something else. I don't know what all they're doing. But never worked. The one on the right is the Tata new home screen. Tata tried this. They said, oh, we can do a super app where everybody does everything. Well, as I wrote, it looks like they have shipped their org chart. Right? It really doesn't work. So that is the other barrier. So you cannot create a one big app and say, I'm going to solve everything. It doesn't work. So what do we know? The three things that we know are, there's a shallow market, there's limited talent, and there's a distribution barrier. This is what the second wave has taught us. And a lot of people tell this. We didn't want this to end so quickly. We wish we had discovered these limits a little later. Because part of this acceleration happened due to the pandemic. Part of the acceleration happened due to interest rates, etc. But one of the things that people keep saying is that if we had gone a little longer, this market would have expanded a little bit more, more people would have come in, more engineers would have come, it would have been slightly better. It came a little too soon. But that's the thing about S-curves. You can't predict when they come. You only know that they're here. And you have to figure out what to do with it. So we are here now. What do these lessons tell us about the future? I give three possibilities. 
because I'm going to cheat and I'm not going to give you a straight answer because it's hard to say. The real truth is that the future is not one S curves, it's several possible S curves. And that's what you're seeing right now. You're looking at many things that are like happening and you're saying it could be this, it could be this, it could be this one, it could be anything, you don't know. And fundamentally speaking, it comes down to three. The first S curve, the potential S curve is what I call lending. Now if you see this, fundamentally speaking, credit is actually a form of creating money. A lot of people have said about how credit is really bad in this country and if you give more credit to companies and give more credit to individuals, consumption will rise, people will do things with it, etc. And as a result, the next great S curve for the last next 15 years is going to emerge. Possibly. There's also a very good reason why some people shouldn't get credit, but this is one possibility. The second possibility is ONDC. Now, why is ONDC so important? Actually, I'll talk about ONDC later. The second possibility is AI. And everybody's talking about AI already. Talking about ChatGPT, generative AI, this is the most famous S-curve right now. Everybody's betting on this S-curve. Why? What AI does is it fundamentally uses machines to drive down labor costs. But there's no guarantee this is going to happen. There's no guarantee knowing what else is going to happen. I'll come to NDC. The real thing with ONDC is that unfortunately, because this market has become shallow, because talent is limited, because there are distribution barriers, what has happened is in sector after sector, we have what we call oligopolies, which means that there are two companies or three companies that basically take it and they are trying to figure, figure out ways to get you on top of the pyramid. ONDC is saying, can we create a new distribution method? Can we make this more democratic? Can we create protocols? I know that Professor Srinivasan is going to talk a little bit about protocols later, which you should attend, but this is what ONDC is trying to do. So if you think about it, the three curves, and I didn't plan this, are actually three ways to solve the three problems that the third, second wave taught us. Shallow market, because people can't pay, give them credit. Limited talent, because we don't have enough engineers, maybe AI can help you. We have a distribution barrier, well, maybe ONDC can change that. And we know that one of these, or a couple of these, are going to happen, and they're going to happen this year. This is the year that the S-curve turns. So, these red dots that I plotted are basically points in my career when I changed and did different things. So I didn't really follow the S-curve, I didn't really stick around there, I didn't wait for a new S-curve to come, I just did what I felt like where I was. <coughs> and perhaps that is really the only advice that I can give, which is wait and observe, there's no reason to act if you're not convinced. If you do believe in something, that means you're at the beginning of an S-curve, just like how the Infosys founders were in 1981 or the Flipkart founders in 2007, believe and persevere the S-curve turns. And finally, all I say is, just have fun. And all of these things have a way of working out. Thank you.